Acadia Divinity College, the Graduate School of Theology at Acadia University. My job is to introduce uh, the Reverend Dr. Peter Holmes, and, uh, and it's a joy for me to do that. It was back in the, I think it was the early 90s that I met Peter when he was pastor at uh, First Baptist Church in Montreal. And uh, we took a busload of young people up there to be mentored in cross-cultural ministry. Uh, uh, Barry Morrison was there, Dale Rose, and, uh, and our own Peter Holmes, uh, who's our guest tonight. And, uh, and they looked after our young people and taught them a lot about ministry in the big city. And so we got to know each other at that, uh, at that date. And so it's been my joy to, uh, to visit and to preach in his church uh, as he is the pastor of uh, uh, Yorkminster Park in Toronto. And by the way, I was there, uh, you know, uh, 60 watt, 40 watt. My brother and I played hockey here, and he was, he was a great big defenseman. He was 60 watt, and I was only 40 watt. But uh, the, the Sunday we arrived in, uh, or the Sunday we were preaching in, in York Mr. Park, the power went out all over Ontario. So uh, it was good that it had a few watts there just to uh, help them out. <laughs> anyway, Peter is, uh, is a delight to, to know, to share with, and uh, he's a good friend of Jim Chang's and, and, uh, and a good friend to, to many of us. Brian Stiller was here as one of our guest uh, preachers. Uh, uh, and speakers at the Simpson Lectures a couple of years ago. And Brian said to me, the closest I've ever got to heaven was when I a attended the funeral service uh, for Dr. John Gladstone in Yorkminster Park at Church. And Peter was leading that service. But he said, that's what he said. He said it was the closest I've ever been to heaven. It was the most beautiful service. And, uh, and so this man only talks but he, he walks his talk. He, he's able to. And, and actually, uh, I was up there in uh, Emmanuel Baptist Church at a, at a meeting. And uh, it was an ADC kind of alumni thing. And a lady came over and introduced me, uh, herself to me, who happened to be in the church that night. And I said I was down to Yorkminster Park before I came here. Oh, she said, uh, Peter had the funeral for, for my aunt. And I said to her, I was interested, I said, how do you do? She said, it was absolutely marvelous. And uh, so wherever I go, I hear about that. And by the way, my Christmas reading, uh, two years ago, my Christmas reading was his thesis. Imagine all over your Christmas holidays, you're reading about funerals. And, uh, but look, it was so intriguing and so interesting. And by the way, during that time while I was reading that, there were four funerals. And, and when you're doing that kind of reading, you're kind of evaluating and, and I'll tell you, Peter, one was a 10 out of 10. It was absolutely marvelous uh, way of conducting a funeral. Uh, one was about an 8 or 9 out of 10. And then there were two that were minus 10 below the line of, of all the things that you said we shouldn't be doing. <laughs> but but uh, I, I just found that so intriguing. So we look forward tonight as you come to the second of your lectures and share with us the insights that God has given you and, uh, the, the, uh, and the practice of ministry as well as the, the research you've done and, and share with us. We look forward to your coming. Is this on? It is. David, thank you for your kind words. When the power started monkeying around on us here tonight, it took me back to that day in Yorkminster Park when the, when the power went out all through the, through the north and through the east. And uh, I wondered about if we needed a little more wattage. But uh, you're very kind, and uh, you certainly brought back some wonderful memories of, of, those, of that summer when you did bring up your wonderful young people from, uh, from, Monk, from no, it was, it was from Dartmouth. And uh, that, w that was a very special time. You had a, w a, w a great ministry uh, through your mission teams, and uh, we were grateful to be a part of that. A lady died in January of last year, 2007. And about three months later, uh, family members were going through some of her bills, some of the things that had been coming in the mail, and they found that there was a bill from a bank 
for her visa um, or her account or something, and, and that she had been, though she had a balance, she had no outstanding balance on the account, she had been charged service charges for three months um, after she had died, and uh, it all came with interest and everything, I think, to $60. And so they phoned, and the family member said, I'm calling you to tell you that my aunt has actually died back in January. And the, and the bank said, the account was never closed, and the late fees and charges still apply. And, and, and the family member said, well, maybe you should turn it over to collections. And they, <laughs> and they said, well, since two months have passed, we already have. And... And uh, the family member says, so, so what will they do when they find out she's dead? And they said, the bank said that they'll either report her account to Frauds Division or report her to the credit bureau, maybe both. <laughs> and I don't think the person was trying to be sacrilegious or anything. They said, do you think God will be mad at her? And the bank employee said, excuse me? A and the person said, did you get what I was just telling you, the part about her being dead? And the bank person said, you'll have to speak to my supervisor. <laughs> the supervisor gets on the phone. The family member says, I'm calling you to tell you that my aunt died back in January. And this, the, the supervisor said, the account was never closed and the late fees and charges still applies. And the family member said, you mean you want to collect from her estate? And the bank supervisor stammering said are, are, are you her lawyer and uh, the person said no I, I'm her, her uh, great nephew uh, but I'd be glad to give you out the lawyer information and the bank supervisor said could you fax us a death certificate uh, sure and so the fax number was given and, and they faxed it right then and there and the bank person said and I found this very profound our system just isn't set up for death. <laughs> I don't know what more I can do to help. And the family member said, well, if you figured out, great. If not, you could just keep billing her. I don't think she'll care. <laughs> and the bank supervisor said, well, the late fees still apply. <laughs> and the family member said, would you like her billing address? And the bank said, that might help. <laughs> and the family member said, Odessa Memorial Cemetery, Highway 129, Plot 69. <laughs> the bank supervisor said, sir, that's a cemetery. And the family member said, and what do you do with dead people on your planet? <laughs> Sometimes I feel like our system just isn't set up for death. I, I had a family member, I mean, and you, these are multitude, these stories, but someone came to me, in all seriousness, a man, and I didn't know him very well, but I knew him by reputation. Um, he had retired just around the time I came to the church. He'd been very active in the church, but after retirement, he had a place in the summer up north, a place down south in the winter, and he wasn't around all that often. But it was a few days before Christmas. He called me to say he was coming in. His wife had just been killed in Florida. She was out Christmas shopping just a few days before Christmas, and a, a truck ran a red light, and she was dead instantly. She had served as the secretary of our board of deacons. She was a very fine woman by reputation, and I knew that. Our families, in fact, shared some connections. So it, it wasn't a, a stranger at all, although I didn't really know him very well. And he said to me when he arrived, the first thing he said to me when he came through the door was, he said, look, my wife was a really upbeat person. So we just want to celebrate her life. We, we, we don't want this to be a sad occasion in any way, shape, or form. She was such a good person. We just want to celebrate. Now, if that, this had been very early on in my ministry, I might have and probably would have um, said, okay, let's, 
we'll work on that. We'll, we'll do something about that. I'd heard about people, co- people had come to me very early in my ministry and said, you know, we were at such and such a funeral over at such and such a church, and it was just such a celebration, and it was wonderful. It wasn't all about death and sadness, and I remember being quite taken with that, as they were, because they were so enthusiastic. And indeed, in some of my early readings, and when I look back on my early funerals, and some of the things I turned to for resources, there's that poem by Henry Van Dyke. I don't know if you know it. It's actually, he was a beautiful writer. He was the minister in the early, I think the early 20th century of the Brick Church in New York City, and uh, gave to us things like, joyful, joyful, we adore thee. He's, he, you know, he's a wonderful uh, minister and a very gifted writer, wrote a lot of short stories including that one about the, the fourth Magi, uh, which is a beautiful story if you ever read it, and I'm sure many of you have. Um, but he wrote this poem, and, and I had used it early on, and uh, maybe you have too. I'm standing upon the seashore. A ship at my side spreads her white sails to the morning breeze and starts for the blue ocean. She's an object of beauty and strength. I stand and watch her until it Length she hangs like a speck of white cloud, just where the sea and sky come to mingle with each other. Then someone at my side says, there she's gone. Gone where? Gone from my sight, that's all. She's just as large in mast and hull and spar as she was when she left my side, and she's just as able to bear her load of living freight to her destined port. Her diminished size is in me, not in her. And just that moment when someone at my side says, there she's gone. There are other eyes watching her and other voices ready to take up the glad shout, here she comes. And that is dying. It's, it's a lovely piece, and, and we may reclaim it before this is over. It's a, it's a lovely piece, and, and it's very easy, you see, to step in and take something like that and step in and you say, you see, that's, that's dying. We, we can really be very happy today and accentuate the virtues and the positive things about the person's life and all of the goodness of the gift of life and celebrate. And there are other readings. I think of one, uh, again, it comes from, from uh, Henry Scott Holland, uh, uh, from St. Paul's Cathedral, um, again, early in the 20th century. Death is nothing at all, he writes. I've only slipped away into the next room. I am I, and you are you. Whatever we were to each other, that we still are. Call me by my old familiar name. Speak to me in the easy way that you always used. Put no difference in your tone. Wear no forced air of solemnity or sorrow. Laugh as we always laughed at the little jokes we enjoyed together. Play, smile, think of me. Pray for me. Let my name be ever the household word that it always was. Let it be spoken without effect, without the trace of a shadow on it. Life means all that it ever meant. It's the same as it ever was. There's unbroken continuity why should I be out of, my mind beca- out of mind because I'm out of sight? I'm waiting for you for an interval somewhere very near, just around the corner. All is well. Again, something very beautiful that, that touches people, that enables them to maybe to get through the passage and to say, isn't this life such a wonderful gift? Everyone likes those poems. And as I say, I I did turn to them from time to time early in my ministry. And then it was shortly after I moved to Montreal, I was called on to do a funeral. And it was someone in the church who had become, in a very short time, very special. A leader in the church who had been very instrumental in me coming there, in helping our family to, to move and to adjust, and the children were very young. It was, it was a very big move for our family into a, a part of the country we'd never lived in or imagined living in, away from family entirely now. And he one day was out shopping with his wife. I only learned after the fact, well, when I learned of his death, he, he that afternoon had sold his business, and his wife had been his secretary 
for all these years, and they were just a wonderful couple. In fact, she was a maritimer, so that tells you. In fact, her name, and I'll just tell you her last name before she was married was Steves. And, and I think some of you probably spell that S-T period, um, depending on which province you're from. And his name was Steve, so he was an S-T period kind of person too. These were saints. They were just wonderful people. And all of a sudden, that night, after selling his business, they'd gone to the mall to do some shopping, and he had dropped dead. Just like that, the twinkling of an eye. The family had rushed from the various parts. It was, it was I, I don't know, they wanted a celebration too. And so it, it was the fall, and I was out raking the leaves. We had some big trees, and I was raking the leaves just the day before the service, as I was thinking in my head about this service, and every time I got the leaves into a pile, they just blew away. And, I was, and I'd put them in another pile, and they'd blow away. And I started getting very angry, and I started getting angry at the leaves. And, and I started to lecture them. And the wind, I was getting very angry at the wind that was blowing up. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me, that I really wasn't, and I should have known better, I wasn't angry at the leaves, I wasn't angry at the wind. I was angry at death. I was angry at death because it had taken this person out of my life, out of the life of a church, and when you just go to a church, a church that, that is, as many churches are vulnerable, needing its leadership desperately, and suddenly someone's taken, and you've just arrived to help them, to help provide leadership. I wasn't angry at the leaves. I knew in my heart from that moment on that I was angry at death and I couldn't possibly celebrate what had happened because what had happened was absolutely awful. I like to read poetry, as you may have picked up, and th there's a poem that had never spoken to me in the way that it did then. And I like Auden. Stop all the clocks. Cut off the telephone. Prevent the dog from barking with a juicy bone. Silence the pianos, and with muffled drum, bring out the coffin. Let the mourners come. Let airplanes circle, moaning overhead, scribbling on the sky the message, he is dead. Put crape bows round the white necks of public doves. Let the traffic policemen wear black cotton gloves. He was my north, my south, my east and west, my working week and my Sunday rest, my noon, my midnight, my talk, my song. I thought that love would last forever. I was wrong. The stars are not wanted now. Put out every one. Pack up the moon and dismantle the sun. Pour away the ocean and sweep up the wood. For nothing now can ever come to any good. There's a poet who's willing to face it right on and to say something awful has just happened here. And name it. Death is an awful thing. I couldn't read the celebratory poems anymore after that. I came to understand in my own heart that there's a loss and a grief that, that is deep and you can't simply smooth it over with words, with nice sentimental poetry. There was, a, there was around that time, there was a, we had a Boy Scouts program in the church, and, and one of the, one of the mother boys, his mother dropped dead, an aneurysm. She was in her 30s. And they didn't attend the church, but I was trying to get to know the families. And I heard about it. The funeral was going to be over at the funeral home, and they had called a, a neighboring minister in to conduct the funeral. And at the funeral, he tried to turn it into a celebration. And he looked at the husband and the children, and he said, don't cry. God has taken your mother to make of her an angel so that she can always watch over you. Where do we get this stuff from? What, what's, what's the, where, where does this need come from to to pretend that nothing bad is, to, to somehow make something good out of it, and it's nonsense. Where do we get this stuff from? I was stunned. I was speechless when I heard this. All I could think was, 
if, if this is what God's done, I want to speak to God and tell him that what these children need is their mother. But something terrible has happened in this family and we're willing to say God knew better and he took your mother to be an angel. Where do we get this stuff from? Why, why, why aren't we reading the Bible or talking about Jesus as I, as I said last night? Or why aren't so many? And why, why do we turn to these sentimentalities? And as I said last night, a friend said to me, he said, we're afraid to offend. Offend what? Offend, on, one, on one level, I think that he's right. That one of the things we're desperately afraid to offend are the good manners of our people. We're living in an age that doesn't like to talk about death. Like that bank, we're not programmed to deal with death. We don't talk about it. We hide it away. When people are dying, we put them in places where we don't have to see them. It's not good manners to talk about death. I remember we, we do a little thing in our church when people die. We always have a little act of remembrance, we call it, um, on our communion Sundays where we just say a few words about them. And, and I remember when I first did this, and a woman came to me and said afterwards, you said they died. We, we say passed away. Now, there's nothing wrong with saying passed away, but there's nothing wrong with saying died either. But there's just something about it. We, we had a guest minister in our church one summer, a very good preacher. It was the first time he'd preached, and he preached a sermon well, I, when I came home from holidays, I said, how was he? I hadn't had a chance to listen. And someone said, well, you know, he, he was pretty good, but he talked about death. And someone else said, yeah, and, uh, he talked about death. It's kind of a downer. And, <laughs> and, and that's not just my people. That's pe we live in a time when people don't want to talk about death. And we're afraid to offend that sensibility, even in the face of it. Another thing I think that we're afraid of are the emotions. Um, and there was a piece, the Michael Valpe piece in the Globe and Mail, um, it contained quite a bit of information from the Bishop of Calgary, the Roman Catholic Bishop, who has banned any eulogies, and that's quite common in the Roman tradition, as I said. But one of the reasons he gave was because we're there, he didn't say to celebrate life, he said we're there to celebrate the resurrection, and if we're celebrating the resurrection, then no one should be crying, and it's too easy for people to cry. We're afraid of the emotions. Someone said to, we had a funeral, actually the president of our choir died, he was a wonderful man, and the father of three young people in our choir, and he used to stand beside me. I had the, the choir, I'm standing there, and the choir's all here and over there. He's, he was right beside me, and he would sing into my ear. He had a wonderful voice. And it was his funeral, and one of his daughters, a lovely woman, gave a tribute. And she said, she said, you know, I know that Dad would not want this to be a sad occasion. He would want us just to sing and to be happy today. And she sat down, and now it's my turn. I've got to get up and speak. And then at another funeral, somebody said, it was, it was a young man in the church, in about 40 years of age, died. Left his widow and two children. And his sister met me just as we were about to start the service. She took my hand and with a very firm resolve said, we are not going to be sad today. We are not. We're afraid of that emotional sensitivity of being touched in that deep place and, and breaking down because we don't know what's next when we do. And so we deny the feelings. And we don't read Auden. We look instead to the, to the sentimental passages. And of course there is also the spirit of the age that we're living in, which talks about all kinds of things and is really back to, to Plato and Socrates so often when it comes to death. The death is our friend. Death, death is the one that gives us release from the prison of the body. And so there's, there's, that's very common too. And it's very easy to fall prey to that understanding of death. Just two weeks ago, I was conducting a funeral. A woman in the church 
who was uh, in, well into her 80s, called me and said that her daughter had died on the weekend. Could I conduct the funeral? I knew this woman quite well. I didn't know her daughter very well, but I said I, would gl- I, w- I was coming. I was going to be there. Uh, she told me that two of the, the, her daughter's friends were going to speak, and they spoke very well. One of them, uh, the second one, when she finished, she said, I have a poem that I'd like to read. And I think it says exactly what we think today. And I had no idea this was coming. And again, I'm up next, so. She said this. She said, Do not stand at my grave and weep. You must know this. I am not here there. I do do not sleep. I'm a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glints on snow. I'm the sunlight on ripened grain. I'm the gentle autumn rain. When you awaken in the morning's hush, I am the swift uplifting rush of quiet birds in circled flight. I am the soft stars that shine at night. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I'm not there. I did not die. Now what are you going to say? Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there. I did not die. The woman giving the eulogy sat down. I didn't have to say anything. Do you know why? What do you think she did when she sat down? She started to weep. She started to weep, and she's weeping. Why? Because it's a lie. Because it's a lie, and deep down in the depths of our being, we know it's a lie. And it's a lie that we we have to expose. I think it's the lie that, that we come across... Do you, do you remember, in, and I haven't done a lot of thinking about this to see where it fits, but, but in, I keep thinking about it. Genesis 3, 4, the time of the fall. Do you remember what the serpent said to Eve? You will, you will not die. You will not die. I am not there. I did not die. You will not die. Death is, Auden's got it what death is. I had it that day when I was out there raking the leaves. It is loss. It is separation. It is alienation. It is brokenness. And we need to name that. We need to do it in, in as compassionate a way as we can so that we don't wave it in people's faces when they get up and read the poem. I didn't have to say anything. The woman who gave the eulogy is crying. She's crying. I got up and spoke to her tears, is what I did, and acknowledged them. And that's okay. We need to speak and acknowledge death. We need to give people permission to have their feelings, whatever they are. The woman I spoke about who who was killed in that car, that terrible car crash a few days before Christmas... As uh, her husband sat down, and uh, her, her widower, he sat down in my study, and I just let him talk, and he was talking, and his daughter was in there talking about her, and I was learning things that I didn't know about her, because I didn't know her very well, and one of the things they told me that was quite remarkable was they told me that she had an incredible mind. She had a mind where everything in her whole life was organized, and they started to tell me what that meant. And one of the things that, that, that this widower said was, he said, you know, I could, I could be here doing some work in Toronto, and I'd be in, in, the, in the house, and I'd call her down in Florida in the condo, and I'd say, honey, I can't find this thing. And she would say, go to the bedroom, go to the cupboard, the third shelf, the farthest along, second to the right, and there it is. She said, he said, that was her mind. It was, and, and, and the daughter started talking about things like this, too. And so I said at the funeral to these people who only wanted to celebrate, having acknowledged this about her mind, I said, today I feel as if we're standing before one of those cupboards looking for something, but it's not where it's supposed to be. In fact, nothing is. We're standing here staring into this once ordered universe, and all we see is the darkness. And we'd rather turn away because we stare into it 
to stare into it so completely is absolutely overwhelming. And yet, no matter where we turn, it's still there. The darkness, the confusion. I said, it's as if we had her on the line and everything was in its right place until suddenly the connection was severed. And now we don't know where to look or even what we're looking for. And so we stand here wondering how and why all this could have ever happened. I then acknowledge the fact that the first words her, her, her very early in the conversation, her husband had, had said to me that, that age-old mystery about why do bad things happen to good people. And I said, I acknowledged his question. I said, I don't want to pretend I have all the answers today because I don't. Because every time I think that I do, something like this comes along and shakes it all up again. There must be, I said, feelings of anger. And there is pain and there's confusion. Perhaps you're still shocked and you don't know how you feel. And there are doubts and there are tears. And all of those are okay today. They play an important part in dealing with this terrible loss that you're facing. And please don't think that any of these feelings are contrary to faith. These feelings are the context of your faith. Simply to face them is to exercise a faith. We need, we need to acknowledge and give people permission to acknowledge death as loss, as separation, as alienation, and to, and to own the feelings that they have. And not to feel badly about the feelings. Give them permission to grieve, to cry, to be angry. We don't need to hit them over the head with this. We need to speak to them sensitively. The woman in the choir, she said, I know that Dad just wants us to sing and be happy today. I had to change what I was going to say. I stood up and I said, I want to sing too. But how do you sing the Lord's song in a strange land? I said, every time I, I sing in the church, I'm here and he's here singing in my ear. And I can't sing now without him singing in my ear. How do we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? It's all right if you don't feel like singing today. Because, boy, do we miss his voice. We need to acknowledge that death is loss and separation and alienation and not to gloss it over as if it's just nothing at all, as one of the poets said. The sister who took my hand and, and said with a, with a strong look in her face, we're, we're not going to be sad today. I, I took her hand gently. I said, but I am sad. I'm sad for the children. I'm sad for his wife. I'm sad for you. I am sad. And in the midst of it all, of course, as, as we do this, there's going to be anger. We need to be aware that, and I said that today, that the people are going to be angry. I was angry at the leaves. Anger is part of the, grieve, anger is part of the grieving process. We need to help people direct their anger, to know what they're angry about. Give them permission to be angry at death. Sometimes they're going to be angry at God. The mother, the woman had just sat down crying. And she said, don't stand on my grave and weep. I'm not there. I, I did not die. I, I said, you know, I feel angry today. I feel angry because this woman, this dear woman I've known who served God so faithfully, her husband has died and both of her daughters have died, and she's alone. And I just don't think it's right when a parent buries a child, and when a parent buries both of her children, something's really wrong. And I don't feel good about this. I acknowledged it. I said, uh, I said on that occasion, I said, you may feel angry, too. You may even think God. I said, it's okay. Tell him. And I told them about a story about a little boy. And I saw this in the mall one Friday night. We were shopping. And this little, the father was sitting there in a chair. 
And the little boy had been at the checkout counter and wanted some candy, and the father said no, and I think the boy had missed his naps that day. And, and the boy, the, you can relate to this if you're a parent, the boy started to scream at his father. He started to say, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And, and this was wonderful to watch. Not that part, but the father didn't react. The father enveloped his arms around this child, and within 10 seconds, the child fell asleep in the father's arms. That's what God's like. We have all of these feelings. We're, we're little children before death. We need to acknowledge the separation of death and its impact on our family and on our community. I want to say this too. Death is real. And, and death is separation. Jürgen Moltmann, in his book, Spirit of Life, a wonderful book, theologian Jürgen Moltmann, talks about death. In order to get to life and to resurrection, he says we have to acknowledge death and how absolutely complete it is. Death, he says, stops all the clocks. He sounds like Auden. It brings an end to time. That's it. It's over. Don't say I'm just there. I'm still there. Don't, don't address me differently. Death is final. It's over. Hamatilica said he didn't like people talking about death as a clock and it's come to the end. Because he said clocks are circular and they're always going around. And we, we you know that old phrase, same time next week. As if, you know, you can... He said, he said, Tilica said, death is a stream. And you enter it and at some point, and, and you, there's no going back. You're going downstream. There's no going back. There's no circle. And at some point, you go over the edge, over the falls. It takes you away. I think of Isaac Watts. Beautiful hymn, Time like an ever-rolling stream bears all her sons away. An ever-rolling stream. Sometimes it meanders slowly. And then sometimes very suddenly, it's, it's over. Time. Time. We can't go back. Death. Death, he said, to lays claim to the body and destroys it. For all of the efforts in our society for, ab about anti-aging, it's a multi-billion dollar industry that, that we do to, to make ourselves look younger, to, to deny the impact of death. We think, well, it's going to be the other people, but it breaks all of us. Some of us slowly, some of us quickly. Death lays claim to the body and destroys it no matter what we do. It's going to take us. And then he says death leads to alienation and loneliness. It robs us of our best relationships. It destroys community. We need to understand that so that we won't fall prey to the lie he's still here, alive in our hearts. Or death is nothing. Or... Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there. I did not die. We need to understand the, the full impact of death. But, but, okay, we do that. And the reason people don't like to talk about it is because what if that's all there is? What if the service or the sermon or whatever ends there? then we would rather not go there because we'd rather celebrate and not have to face that. And that's the anxiety if that's all there is. But we are servants of Christ. And we are here not only to give people permission to acknowledge death, but we're also here to proclaim that God is present in the midst. And that God's love is for us. And that his power is greater than death. And so the question is, in the midst of all of this death and, and its devastation on the community, where is God? Where is God? I'm missing a page. Yeah? Well, <laughs> that never happens to me.
There we go. Walter Wink, the theologian, uh, he's a New Yorker, and after 9-11, people went to Walter Wink and they said to him, where is God? And he said, in the silence, in the horror, in the absence, God is present. He's closer, nearer to us than breathing. We may not feel him, but he's there. And that's the call of the preacher, to acknowledge the presence of God. Now, when I was caring for that family, when the woman had been killed in Florida, I already told you how I took them to that cupboard and stood them in front of the cupboard and said, it's darkness and we can't find our way. I didn't leave them in that cupboard, staring into the darkness. The question that they'd been asking me all through that day or two leading up to the service, because they wanted to do it before Christmas, why now? Why at Christmas? Mother loved Christmas, they kept saying. Why now? Over and over, they asked me this. And uh, we, one thing we don't get into, we don't want to get into as clergy, is trying to answer the question, why? We're there really to help the people through. There, there are mysteries beyond us. There are some questions there may not be answers to, and certainly that we cannot answer. So we, we have to be careful with that. But they kept saying, why now? Why at Christmas? And I said to them, and I said in the service, I said, I know that everyone's asking why now. Of all times, she loved Christmas. Like with the way she fussed over Christmas. Why now? I said, I don't know. But this I know. That now is why we have Christmas. That because of the brokenness that we are experiencing, because we're staring into the dark and into the confusion and into the horror of this moment, is why Christ came into this world. It's why God sent his Son. Because he loves us and he sent his Son into the darkness of this world to take upon himself our brokenness. That we might know that we stand not alone in this space. But there's one who is with us and one who goes on before us and shows us the way through. And so what, I, what I'm saying is we need to take the people in their own terms, find it somehow in their story to say, here is the brokenness. The, the woman in the choir, she, she says, we, we, we've got to sing today and be happy. And I say, how do we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? The woman who's so well-organized. I say, we're standing there in front of this well-organized universe and all is lost. Find it within their story so that you can say it in their words, that they can then step into the picture and then, and then in their story speak to them of the goodness of, of God's love and mercy and grace. And so that brings us to, to the cross and to the victory of, of Christ over death. And so we speak to, to, to Christ and his work in this world. And now I'm not telling you what to say at a funeral. I'm just telling you what we, what we believe and, and the essence of our gospel. When we think about Moltmann's death, separation in terms of time, in terms of the body, in terms of the family and alienation, Christ, the Eternal One, has entered that stream of time that... Tillica speaks about, willing to take the fall of death and to know the end of time, the one who is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, is willing to come to an end, to break the spell and the hold of death upon humankind and upon creation. We think of of death as separation in the community and in the family. In his life, Jesus invested himself in building community, in breaking down barriers between hostile enemies. He offered his teachings that, that had within them the call to a new community and a new family and a new life, one marked by forgiveness and by grace, not by authority but by servanthood. 
And yet having given us this gift of community, he goes to the cross alone. There were others there. But we know that he gave his beloved disciple to his mother and his mother to his beloved disciple. A gesture as a sign that Jesus was taking upon himself the brokenness of the community and family, the alienation of death, so that he could give us back to one another and restore the family of humankind. Christ has come to break death and its hold and its spell. In death, Jesus bore the alienation of this world. Evident in his cry from the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The loneliness, the alienation, the brokenness of the world on our Savior. Taking upon himself the separation between God and humankind. Climaxed in that moment of his death. When he who knew no sin became sin, so, so that we who were dead in our trespasses and sins, might know the righteousness of God. And so that with the weight of the world, sin upon him, he might cry out, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. In dying, he embraced the brokenness of time, the brokenness of the body, the brokenness of the community. And from the story of Christ on the cross, The preacher can affirm that God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble, but that's not all. Because death doesn't have the last word, and this is the good news. That God raised him up from the dead, and in doing so said yes to his plea for mercy for the world. Father, forgive them, yes, he says, as he raises him up from the dead. And the victory of Christ over death has been granted to all who will embrace it by the grace of Jesus Christ. Our role at the funeral is to proclaim Christ's victory over death and its relevance to the whole world. I love the passage from Ezekiel. A passage that that reminds us, you know, Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones when God says to him, Ezekiel, can, can these bones live again? And Ezekiel says, in this vision, he says, God, you know. God, you know. We don't have to raise people up from the dead. We just have to point them to the one who does. And God says, preach to these bones. Preach to them. Tell them about the new life. That's our call to preach to death a new life from God through the gift of his Son, Jesus Christ, offered to us all in his grace through his resurrection. Now, I I want to say just one other thing, And, and that is earlier I hinted that we might reclaim Van Dyke. I don't really think we need to. I think we can do better. But in the resurrection, we, we can say, when, when, death, when someone says death means reunion, death means release, and that's often heard. I have people say to me all the time, it's such a release, death. Death is not a release. Resurrection is the release. Death is the separation, the alienation, the brokenness. Resurrection is the release. And so too, resurrection is reunion. Now, there are some who warn against this in preaching of funerals, who say that it's too sentimental to talk about people being reunited because there's too much that we don't know. But what we do know was that when Jesus was here and he moved among people, well, think of him in Luke's Gospel with the widow at Nain. He not only raised up her son, but when he raised up her son, he restored her personhood and restored the relationship. It was a reunion with that mother. It was as much new life for her as it was for him. It was a community, a gift to the community. We think of him at Lazarus' grave. He raises Lazarus from the dead. After he weeps, 
with Mary and Martha. The gift of resurrection is as much for Mary and Martha as it is for Lazarus. It is reunion, this new life. We shall be caught up together, together with him. But what we do need to guard against is that reunion and communion of saints, if you will, does does not take precedence over reconciliation with God. And that's what we're really to proclaim, the oneness that we have in Christ. Perhaps one of the most beautiful passages that, that I can think of for a funeral, in, in, and I love the story of, of the prodigal son. The reunion of the prodigal son with the father is the climactic moment. Whatever other reunions may or may not take place after the fact, it's the father's reunion with the son that's first. And the father's proclamation in the parable is the proclamation of God the father as he welcomes his children home. This my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Thanks be to God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dr. Holmes, um, you've talked about the... uh, the funeral mostly, um, and about how to uh, preach effectively at a, at a funeral. Um, oftentimes, uh, uh, in fact, in my setting, probably the last five funerals that I have done, I've been called into uh, a week before the person has passed away, usually in a hospital room or at a home where they're dying. And the uncertainty is that these are not church people or have not attended our church, but it be, because I'm the only pastor in the community is being called in to, to do the funeral a week in advance before the person is gone. And the struggle that I feel during that week is very, very painful because I feel a responsibility in order to know where this person is spiritually and trying to make sure in that week it's, it's a fight against death. It's a battle that, that, that you get involved in. And then there's always the uncertainty that even though you thought maybe they understood, or a lot of them are under uh, medication to the point where you don't know whether they're understanding what you're saying to them. And by the time that you go into the funeral, at the end of that week, I feel an exhaustion, hmm. a spiritual exhaustion in coming to that pulpit because of this struggle of knowing whether they are saved eternally or not. How, how do you deal with a situation like that when you are with a family and you know they only have a few days and you spend time with as much as you can? And, and the other thing is that there are so many people that have to be around this person, family, and that, that it's very hard and difficult sometimes to get that quality time to be able to speak to that person. Yeah. Um, we talked a bit about this earlier today, but... Um, appreciate that. That's, that is an exhausting um, process. Even if you know, you know of the person's faith and all of that, it's still an exhausting thing to walk with a family um, at the time of death. And I commend you for uh, your presence. I think that's a great gift. And, and um, you have no idea what that means to the family. Um, and so... You know, as I said earlier this morning, and for those of you who weren't there, in the end, we don't pronounce, you know, where the person goes or anything like that. What we do is we offer them to God. Um, But there's something else that you're offering that's very beautiful. And in, in the time of dying, you're offering a presence, and it's a gift. And we just, we don't know what's in the heart. And you say you don't know if they hear or not or how they respond in the moments when you're not there. I, I think of my, my, Andrew last night mentioned uh, Care Spears, a minister I worked with in Toronto, a mutual friend. And when Care was serving in a church in Scotland, um, 
he, he was leaving the church. He had finished his time there. And, and a young woman gave him a note in which she thanked him for believing during the times when she couldn't believe. Mm -hmm. And you're there to sometimes be believing for them and acknowledging the presence and the grace of God. And you do that simply by your presence, by your offering of readings, of scripture, and prayers. And we don't know what's in their heart, and it's not for us to determine. And at the end of the day, we can thank God for the time that we had with them, and we can speak of the scriptures that we read with them, the prayers that we shared with them. And, and I, I think that there's peace in that. Um, I also think that, um, as, and I'll tell you what I, again what I said this morning is, and I've been in some situations where I, the people have had uh, not, not had any signs of any sort of uh, involvement in religious life at least. I don't know for sure what's in their heart. And I've been called on. And I, I acknowledge, I say, I'm not here to pretend that they were religious or that they attended church all the time. But I am here to give witness to, to the God, the Jesus, to Christ, who came as the good shepherd who leaves the fold and goes out in search of the lost sheep when all the rest of us are stuck here. And who's not afraid to offer his life to find them and to bring them home to the Father. And in his name, we offer this one into the hands of God. That's what we do. Um, I don't know if that helps you, but it helps me. And um, uh, bless you for being there for those families. You have no idea what your presence means to them. And one day, one of them may write to you and say, thank you for believing even when I couldn't. And, and so bless you for that. It's not easy. You're absolutely right. It's exhausting. Yeah. Um, you've talked a lot about funerals that um, with people who are younger and who have died um, unexpectedly. Um, when dealing with people who have lived long lives and they've lived them well, and um, often la death is there, it's agonizing, and the family is grieving through the process of death, especially if dementia is involved, and they've lost the person through the process. So the experience of death is often one of the most powerful feelings is relief, as you are relieved at the loss, the end of the suffering, and the life that has been well lived. In that case, do you see uh, more room for celebration in a funeral? I, I believe that a funeral can be celebration through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That we move, we do not let death have the last word. That, that we acknowledge the sorrow and the grief and then we can move the people. And it's much easier to move them in that situation. And, and in fact, it's natural to speak of release. But we just have to be careful that, that um, we're not thinking that release is, that death is our friend. And it has come to take the person home. Christ is our friend. And the one who's conquered death. And... and it, Alzheimer's is a terrible thing. We've, we, I've been through it in my own family. Um, and it's absolutely a release. Um, but there's another sense in which, you know, m my grandfather cared for my grandmother during her period of Alzheimer's. And it was the meaning of his life, caring for my grandmother. And uh, he did it in his home as long as he could. And when he had to put her in a nursing home, he went every day by the bus when he wasn't really well enough to go himself. And then she died. And you know, he was broken hearted when she died. Not only had he lost this, even the remnant of this woman he loved, but although he couldn't say it like this, he had lost his meaning in life, which was caring for the woman he loved. And I can remember because after that he came and lived with our family. And for about a year, every day at the dinner table when he would say a prayer, he would, he would begin by speaking, thanking God for his beloved and still offering her to God. 
those things uh, touch me more now, I think, than they did at that time. Hmm. But um, for him, the death was still very hard. But it is a reality that, um, and, and you're right, you know, you're right, but it, that it's much easier at the end of the day to move towards celebration um, in, in that kind of setting. But this are still, our celebration is rooted in Christ's victory over death. It's not rooted in Alzheimer's having the final say, right? It's not sort of the knockout punch of Alzheimer's has given her release. It's that on the other side, there's someone. And th this is why I'm not crazy about resurrecting Van Dyke. I, I, and and it may appeal to you in a maritime province, and I grew up on the ocean, but what I like to speak about is the one who comes to us in the storms of life, um, who, who can speak to the wind and the waves and they obey him. And he comes to us and carries us to the other side. And that's our, that's our gospel image. And um, so that's, anyways, I've probably gone on too long, but, but it is much easier to celebrate when a person has lived a long, full life it's what we all long for, to, to when we die, to have a full life, to, to be able to have our family around us, to say goodbye and to let go. And, and that's a beautiful death. Um, the kind of thing that I was talking about, one of those sacred moments when you get to be there um, last night. Okay, so, a question here. thank you. Hi, my name is Roxanne. My husband and I are both ordained pastors. I'm not going to pretend to have a question. I just have an open mic. <laughs> But I've written it down, so it'll be brief. Um, uh, together, we, uh, in ministry, we buried a newborn and a woman who was 105 years old and a 50-year-old man who committed suicide and lots of others uh, filling the spectrum in between. And the pain of the loved ones was real. I mean, there's no doubt about that. And three and a half months ago, I buried my husband at 48, mm. uh, who died instantly of a heart attack, uh, totally unexpected. The funeral was a beautiful acknowledgement um, of his faith, of the reality of death, and of um, the hope of Jesus Christ. And there were over 400 people there, and mm. many people from the community spoke to me about how meaningful it was and the message that was given. And these were people who hadn't been in the church, and it was uh, really spoke boldly to them. Um, I just want to say that pain is real, and the separation uh, is still real after the pain subsides. And I want to thank all of those who have supported me and offered prayers for myself and my family, and uh, encourage you to continue to do so, especially for the children. And uh, I'm like I said often in the first month, the paralytic, but I was depending on the faith of my friends, and, uh, mm. and that's what you just spoke to as well. And so I'm really grateful for God's love shown through his people. I, I do want to say two things on my little soapbox here. Uh, I, I want to encourage leaders not to forget the bereaved. Uh, when there's all the hubbub of the funeral or the memorial and everything that's going on, uh, it's encouraging. It's an overwhelming time for the family who was lost. And uh, it can be a feast of all kinds of activity and encouragement. But the famine comes and your life goes on and ours changes forever. Um, three weeks after Tom died, I joined the weekly grief share meeting uh, where I attend worship. And if you're not familiar with that organization, I give it a plug, griefshare.org. Check it out. Good, solid stuff. Lots of solid Christian authors who contribute their insight from their grief experiences to this 13-week Christian curriculum. Um, and it's been immensely helpful for me, to me um, as an ordained clergy, but as a grieving person. Uh, lots of things that have been there that I perhaps didn't understand as well, but I do now. And uh, just one of the things that uh, was reminded to us in that, and uh, we probably know this, but you know, it's an easy thing to, to express to grieving people uh, as time will pass and heal and things like that. And one of the phrases given was, time doesn't heal all wounds, only Jesus heals all wounds. Mm. That's right. Thank you. Excellent. In, fact, in fact, we know that, that, that myth about time heals all wounds. We, we know lots of cases where people are more bitter after time. Um, it's not time that heals wounds. It, it's, it's God and it's giving them to God. Thank you for your um, sharing all that. It's uh, blessed you and uh, encouraged people to continue to keep to keep doing your prayers. Time for one short question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
Dr. Holmes, we had talked a little bit about, uh, in the talk back, about um, cremation. And I'm noticing more and more as I spek to to folks that that, that that is becoming more prevalent even in an area of great tradition uh, up in the Miramichi where I am. Um, how, how could you give some advice perhaps on how to speak to folks who say, I don't want to wake, I don't want the visitation, I don't want the after the funeral uh, get together, um, that's been such a, a staid tradition within a number of our churches. Could you perhaps speak to that? Do they not want a service either, or are they just the... Uh, a service, yes, but it uh, depends on the person that you're speaking to as to what kind of service. Uh, one lady I spoke to said, no, I just uh, I don't want that either at all. Mm -hmm. And these are Christian, by the way, these are Christian folks yeah. who I'm speaking of, so that's why I'm asking the, the question. Um, well, you can, only, you can only pastor them, right? You can't, and it's a very tender and sensitive time. Um, sometimes someone will say to me, you know, so-and-so, you know, dad or whatever, didn't want a funeral. He said he didn't want a funeral. And I just think, you know, my wife always tells me she doesn't want a Christmas present. <laughs> But a funeral, a funeral is for those who are left um, to to deal with their their grief. It's also for the community of faith to proclaim the good news, um, and in that good news to celebrate. I don't want to lose that word, but to celebrate the gift of God, of new life in Christ. Um, and you can simply say that we would be honored in the church family. To, to surround you with our care um, through any kind of visitation you want. We would be honored to, to surround you, uh, to, to offer you the service uh, of a memorial or funeral um, and to hold it in the church. And in fact, I have more recently been offering families um, the church for visitation. And I think it's a wonderful place to have a visitation. I don't know if anyone else has done that, but I'm not saying the funeral home's not a good place, but, but the, fun the church is a great place to have visitation um, if you have a nice room to receive people in. Um, and the funeral homes, have, I have found, the, the funeral home I deal with is very receptive to that. Um, and if, so if, maybe if they know that the church welcomes them for this, um, maybe that will give them some kind of permission, I don't know. So thank you for your question. Shall I end the meeting? That's, that, thank you, Peter. And uh, there will be an opportunity at Talk Back tomorrow morning at 11 to, uh, to ask some, some more questions. And uh, Peter will be there to uh, help answer those questions. Also, he'll be speaking at chapel at the Manning Memorial Chapel tomorrow morning. Service begins at, at 9.45. And then... Tomorrow night, the last of the three lectures coming back to life. And I might say that the 10 out of 10 funeral that I experienced while I was reading your, your text and so on uh, very clearly dealt with the tragedy of the young girl's death, but also spoke so clearly, so clearly, the power and wonder of God's grace in the resurrection. Shall we express our appreciation to Peter tonight? Please.